Hey guys, welcome to my first episode in my new environmental book series. I did pick up three uh, environmental memoirs that I'm going to be reviewing today and you guys can choose if you want to read them or not. So an environmental memoir is kind of a genre that I made up. I also am calling them like nature memoirs, but they're like stories of people's lives who are environmental activists, who are exploring the environment and nature of the place that they come from. And so I think the genre is really interesting. So I'm going to go through three books in this genre today. So the first book I'm going to be talking about is Two Trees Make a Forest in Search of My Family's Past Among Taiwan's Mountains and Coasts. So the first thing I thought about this book is look at this cover. This is a absolutely gorgeous cover. Like this has to be one of the prettiest covers of like any book that I've bought in a really long time. I love the colors, even though that doesn't really say what's on the inside. But I just want to say I am judging this book by its cover. Um, so this book is a memoir about a woman who is feeling the emotions of longing and disconnection from, I guess I'll call them ancestral lands. Um, she is from Taiwan and her family's been all over the world, basically. She's lived all over the world, but Taiwan is where her grandparents um, spent a lot of their life and have a lot of their life stories revolving around Taiwan. But a lot of people coming from an immigrant family might relate a lot to this book because it talks a lot about that feeling of loss of, you know, exploring somewhere where your family is from but you don't have a lot of personal experience but you know you have so much connection to this land and this nature um, from generations past so i think that's a really interesting concept and it's something i personally relate to as well and also i rarely see nature memoirs that are set in anywhere in asia I, I, maybe i'm just ignorant but i haven't seen a lot in english that have that sort of setting. So this one has been actually really unique. I live in Canada, but I come from an American educational background and we did not learn about Taiwan in my school. I had no idea about the colonial history of Taiwan and the dia Chinese diaspora that came to Taiwan um, fleeing persecution. There's a whole history of that um, that they go through on this book. It's not a history book though. It's solidly a memoir about a woman going back to Taiwan and rediscovering her ancestral homelands. My mother, sister, and I stumbled over whether to call ourselves Chinese. We weren't from a China that exists any longer or Taiwanese. No single word can contain the movements that carried our story across waters and across continents. The story of her grandparents and the history of Taiwan is overlaid with this uh, modern context of her exploring the mountains and the island and going backpacking and learning about the birds, learning about all the vegetation and the botany. So she's discovering this while also tracing the family um, back through her lineage. There's also a decent amount on colonialism and how colonial scientists have um, structured the conversations around botany. Like a lot of the names of these um, plants in Taiwan are actually named after colonial people who might not have even set foot on the island, which I think is a really good topic. And I actually wish she expanded on this a little bit more because I think that topic is really interesting. As scientists, it's important to understand like how much of science has been based around colonialism and imperialism and um, European scientists going to, you know, these different countries as part of imperialist missions and, you know, naming and discovering all the plants. So I wish you went a bit more into this, but overall I would give this a four out of five stars. Um, I think this was a really beautiful read. It was a little slow. Uh, and you know, actually all of the books that I'm talking about today went a little slow. And I think that's just part of nature memoirs. Is there a bit slower pace? It's not suspense or mystery or anything like that. Um, but I think it fit really well with the subject and it was actually a really relaxing read. I read this one before bed and, um, I really enjoyed it and now I want to go to Taiwan. So uh, that one sold me on wanting to visit Taiwan. So I give this one four out of five. Next book I'm going to talk about is Grass Sky Song, Promise in Peril in the World of Grassland Birds. And this is by Trevor Harriet. So this book um, was interesting. It was recommended to me by Connell. Hey Connell, if you're watching this. So this book is about the hidden beauty of the prairies. 
and the simplicity of just tuning into what's around you. And I think this book was really needed. I think that a lot of people don't appreciate the grasslands. And as someone who's worked across Alberta and Saskatchewan, this one actually really hit home for me because I recognized a lot of the places that the setting was and a lot of the birds. And um, so I definitely could relate to this one as far as seeing the beauty of these places that are totally overlooked because there are people who think the grasslands and the prairies are like wheat fields. That's a wheat field is a cultivated land and that's not native prairie. <laughs> I, I mean, I probably thought it's the same thing too. I just didn't know enough about grasslands. And so this one is a good um, book if you're really interested in native prairie. And each um, chapter is split up by these little species profiles with um, illustration of the species and a bit of information about each species. And I'm not talking about like informational like bird book. Kind of comes to you like they're te he's teaching you about these species from the perspective of someone like if you were actually going to go bird watching out with them and is going to talk about like, oh, what, you know, this species remind me of being a child on the prairies because every morning, you know, when I'd go out to milk the cows, I would hear this species. So it's more like that rather than the informational rundown of each species. I will also go through some of my criticisms of this book. So it was a little slow. Um, you lost me in the middle, uh, Trevor Harriet. I was struggling um, through the middle. It, it just slowed down and it wasn't, it didn't have really much of like a concrete story that tied all the chapters together. So the end kind of picked up a bit, but I didn't agree with his views on what is impacting grassland birds. Uh, I thought actually some of them were like, a little tough to get through. Okay, here's an example of kind of what I don't agree with. Uh, North Americans have come to believe they're entitled to hassle-free, inexpensive food as though it were a constitutional right. Eating more food locally and according to ecologically sustainable practices would require discipline and sacrifice from a citizenry that the marketplace and agri-food industry has rendered lazy, overweight, and self-indulgent. That's, that's a bold claim that I, I don't really agree with. I did think it was also a little bit too focused on settler culture. So much of the magic and the, um, you know, interesting history of the prairies, I think is in the indigenous people that are in the prairies, not necessarily the settlers who colonized the prairies. And a lot of it was talking about settlers, settler culture, and then like brief instances where he'd mention um, the local indigenous people. But it was a little light on that and I would have wanted to see more of a focus on that because I think that that's real, way more interesting than wheat farmers, but maybe that's just me. The way he wrote this book, it is like, it is beautiful. And that's such an important part of nature writing is to have those feelings of like, you are right there um, in that location. And I think this definitely achieved it. We are fascinated by birds, hold them in our esteem because they put flesh upon, incarnate the soul of the land they inhabit, bringing it to our senses in ways that mammals, insects, or reptiles cannot match. Remove the forest warblers, thrushes, and owls, and the truth of what a forest is and the wisdom it offers is rendered insensible. Oh, so good. Anyway, so considering the upsides and the downsides, I gave this book a three out of five. I would recommend it though, if you are interested in the prairies um, and grasslands and you wanna learn more about grasslands from a North American context. Next book I'm gonna be talking about is Oil and Honey, The Education of an Unlikely Activist. And so I actually listened to this one on audiobook, so I don't have the physical book with me. However, um, I will put the cover right here. So. Oil and Honey is written by Bill McKibben, and you guys might know Bill McKibben. He wrote The End of Nature, which has been called the first global warming book written to the masses by some people. And so he's a really famous uh, nature climate change writer. So this is his memoir about being an environmental activist and also being a beekeeper, they, they, they do go hand in hand a bit um, throughout the book. So this one is both a nature memoir and also an environmental activist memoir. So if you're interested in environmental activism, like as a career, definitely pick this one up. I think this one actually runs down pretty well what it's like to be an environmental activist on an international scale, not like I am one, but it just, he talks a lot about his experiences with that. This story is, goes through two dichotomies. It goes through 
him being a honeybee keeper and learning about honeybee keeping from his neighbor and his simple life in Vermont, basically. So all the nature type of writing there with like intersecting um, his identity as an international advocate for the environment and an international activist running 350.org, which is his environmental organization. And, you know, he's rubbing elbows with uh, Jane Goodall and he name drops a lot of people throughout the book. So he's definitely like a legit environmental activist. It's an interesting combination, I think. And I do not dislike it because I do relate to the dichotomy of wanting to live this simple life, but wanting to also interact globally to help save the planet. And so that's an interesting kind of combination there. I think I wasn't very interested in his 350.org type of stuff. I don't know if this was just me or maybe it was a little bit too in the nitty gritty of like his business and his charity. Um, but I just wasn't super interested in that part. I thought the beekeeping part was way more interesting. And I kind of just wish this was a book about beekeeping, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, he is a well-known international activist, so I understand it. Um, I was also a little confused that he was like calling himself an unlikely activist. Um, you know, he was a writer and a professor. And I don't think it, that's that unlikely. <laughs> so I was kind of like, it's, I mean, I don't know. It kind of makes sense to me. Like the title is called an unlikely activist, but he looks like all the other activists that I always see. So I didn't really get that part. Um, that might just be me. And so I just like, think that the reason why this book was a bit soured for me is I didn't really like his tone, all the noon dropping and all of the kind of like advertising for his charity. This cut, this is coming off really bad. Um, but that's kind of just my reaction to it. I didn't really resonate it with it very much. And I really enjoy books where I can resonate with the author and I relate to them like on a personal level and their struggles and experiences are also struggles that I've experienced. And I just didn't really feel that with this book. Um, so I would give this one a three out of five stars. However, if you're really interested in like international environmental activism and less of like the sciencey nature stuff, uh, I would pick up this book and give it a read. So two um, extra bonus books that I haven't actually read yet, but I did want to mention them in case any it kind of strikes anyone's fancy when I go through the summary of them. So one is Kings of the Yukon, A River Journey in Search of Chinook by Adam Weymouth. And it's a, oh, I'm reading the back now. Um, it's about salmon and tracking salmon spawning and migration and the communities that it goes through. So this one I'm going to read eventually. Um, you can follow me on Goodreads. I'll leave the link in my description if you want to see what I think about that when I eventually read this one. And another one too I just bought this weekend is called Trespassing Across America. Uh, one man's epic never before done and sort of illegal hike across the heartland by Ken Ilgunas. And so this one is about a guy who has a backpacking trip where he actually backpacks across the length of the Keystone XL pipeline through Canada from Hardesty down to Louisiana, I think. And so it's about the Great Plains and the culture of the Great Plains, but also about environmentalism, nature and pipeline expansion. So I'm actually really excited to read this one. I'm going to read. I'm taking some time off uh, over the next two weeks. I'm going to probably read this one on my time off. So this is another kind of environmental memoir that I'm going to check out. So those are all the books that I'm going through today. Uh, I have a big stack here. Um, let me know if you guys have read any of these books, what you think in the comment section down below. If you have any other suggestions for environmental memoirs, I'm going to be doing this series with other environmental subjects. Like um, I'm going to do one video on environmental fiction and um, like wildlife fiction books. So I'm going to kind of split it by genre. I hope you guys are interested in that subject. Let me know and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.